This episode is brought to you by Perennial Finance, the on-chain DeFi primitive redesigning derivatives for the DeFi native. You'll hear more about Perennial later in the show. Hey everyone, this episode is brought to you by Aura, the all-in-one application that protects your safety online powered by AI. Honestly, it is worse to just be a human that exists on the internet from a safety perspective than it ever has been before. I'm constantly getting weird scam phone calls from everyone. I'm sure you guys do too. There are lots of weird phishing attempts that are made to internal employees at Blockworks and on Twitter. So I have to do these posts that, hey, I'll never ask you for money. It just is terrible. The actual statistics is that one in four people now fall victim to cybercrime. And if you operate in crypto, it is even worse. You are more at risk. That's why we're happy to partner up with Aura here. And I'm going to be telling you all about them later in the show. Hey everyone, this episode is brought to you by Mantra, the security first, compliance focused L1, which is onboarding the next wave of financial institutions. You're going to be hearing all about them later in the show. But for now, Mantra, thanks for making this episode possible. All right, guys, um, really excited to do this because this is a panel at DAS, but this is also the first live episode of the 1000X podcast. I am very lucky to be crashing this episode <laughs> with hosts Avi and Jonah. Fellas, could you give a little introduction for yourselves? Yeah, sure. Hey, everybody. I, you know, I've been uh, recording this 1000X podcast with Jonah for the last half a year, courtesy of Blockworks, putting it all together. For the six years before that, I was investing professionally in cryptocurrency and digital assets, first at Way Financial, then I ran uh, the Liquid Book over at uh, Block Tower for about two years, and then I had the amazing experience of actually being able to start up the crypto division at a traditional fund called Golden Tree, uh, which is a distressed debt asset manager, but made the foray into, uh, into cryptocurrency. And I worked there for about two years, helping them start up. And through my journeys, met Jonah, and we decided to start a podcast where we could just talk at each other for 45 minutes to an hour, because we were doing that anyway. So now we're here on stage talking to you guys. Yes. Um, it's very hard to get Avi on the phone unless uh, it's, it's a recorded podcast. He's a, he's a podcasting type of person. So but if there's alcohol involved, it's easier for him. That's what I might, hear. A, a little bit. There, right. there might have been one or two missed podcasts because we were out. <laughs> for both of us. Um, I'm Jonah. Uh, I've been a trader for 18 years. I ran the oil derivatives book at Goldman Sachs. Then I was a partner at VTOL for seven years. It's the world's largest oil trading company. And then after that, I had the privilege of running trading at Cumberland, which is the cryptocurrency arm of DRW. And that's where I met Avi. Uh, we were at Crypto Bahamas together, a bit of an ill-fated moment in crypto's Crypto's history, but you know, happy to be back on the conference. Circuit. What happened in the Bahamas? Well, right, can you refresh first, I just memory? want to say I'm very happy to see at this conference a lack of shorts because at Crypto Bahamas there were far, probably far too many. So, no, people seem like they're put together. This is an indication that our industry has grown up a little bit, which is always nice to said see. Absolutely no flip flops allowed. Um, <laughs> man should never show his bare toes. That's just uh, that should be unsaid. Um, Fellas, I'm, I'm really lucky to have you here. Um, I'm going to resist for as long as I can to ask you guys about meme coins, which is, of course, what we all want to talk about, right? Um, but why don't we just start with this sort of classic uh, question that people tend to ask themselves around this time, which is, where are we in the market cycle, right? So we've had these Bitcoin ETFs. We've had some price appreciation. We're looking at alts run a little bit, but maybe it feels a little bit different than you know previous all-time high breaks. What do you guys think? I think that... In all markets, not just crypto, uh, we, you, know, you tend to start the bull market when things get volatile. So I, you know, I, I could characterize the last year and a half as a bull market, just sort of a steady grind upwards. But I would say that was more of a recovery phase from the extremely painful bear cycle of 2022. I wouldn't really call that the bull market. I would, I would say, you know, in keeping with the title of this panel, how to trade the upcoming bull market, I think we're just getting started as markets really start to enter price discovery phase, especially to the upside, they get very volatile. Um, I think we're out of the high, sharp, steady grind upwards into a phase where we start to get some savage pullbacks, some bull traps, some bear traps, and uh, the type of price action that you might have seen in you know, maybe the NASDAQ in 1999, or crude oil in 2008, or you know, crypto in 2021, where uh, Avi Fellman was trading some of those all-time highs, followed by 70% pullbacks, followed by all-time highs. Yeah, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting. So for the first time ever, we have a different setup for the bull market. So basically, all previous cycles, what you had is you had a bear market 
that came that was really solved by the having, which brought interest back in. And generally what you'd find is that four to six months after the halving is when Bitcoin managed to reach previous all-time highs. This time is different. This time we actually got to the previous all-time highs and surpassed them after the halving or before the halving. And what that tells me is that this time is, is a bit different. There are different factors at play. The environment is different. The industry is m more mature than it was previously and also is very unlikely to follow the same predictable patterns that it had for the last three cycles. And so where do I see us today? Well, the ETF was obviously the big catalyst. And it brought in a lot of inflows very early in the beginning. But we're still early in the process of Bitcoin as an institutional asset penetrating, right? Most of these asset issuers, most of these ETF issuers are still in the process right now of ramping up their marketing, of ramping up their outreach. I'd say if I were to guess, they're about 20% deployed. So we still have 80% to go. Now, with that being said, Bitcoin, it, it doesn't take in the grand scheme of things that much money to move this asset. $10 billion makes an incredible impact on price. And so for the last 10 years, people have had this crazy outlandish target in their minds of Bitcoin at 100K. You know, couldn't we get to 100K? Can we get to 100K? And this sort of sticks in people's minds. And so... Now that we're at 60, 70, 75, we're almost there. And so I think what we've done is we've completed the first phase of the cycle, where we've had the catalyst, we've had the interest, we've had the explosion, but now the hard work begins. Now there's probably a little bit of a slog. It's, will we break 100K? Will we get past 100K? What happens after? And if you actually look back, this started back in 2021. So... Since $20,000 that broke in December of 2020, every time Bitcoin has made a new all-time high, it hasn't gone parabolic. So in 2021, every time it would make a new all-time high, it would actually pull back a little bit. It would chop around, it would grind, it would have these pullbacks, you'd have these issues. And the reason is because people are happy to sell when their target is within sight. And so what I think is we're sort of done with the first half, we're in for a little bit of churn right now. And then over the next six to 12 to 18 months is when we get the inevitable ratcheting up of the marketing from all of these ETF issuers. A tremendous amount of new capital will come into the market and we'll be off to the races. And it's probably going to look a little bit more stable than previous cycles. I don't necessarily think we're going to get another 85% drawdown, maybe a 50, 60%. All right, that was a really helpful framing for me because one thing that's been confusing me a little bit, this is my mental framework going into this all-time high break, is I remember watching the price in December of 2020. when, And you can actually, if you go back and look at that fractal, it was like hovering around 19K and then it just blew through and doubled, went to 40 in like a month or something. And that was the time where it felt like, I just remember how I felt at that time, which was like, oh my God, it's on. you know. And that's when I feel like retail came back to the market. We felt that our business had picked back up. Uh, and it just didn't really feel like that this time. So you think that basically there's kind of like some, not like a triple top type thing, but this is, we did the easy gains. People are more willing to sell at this point, And there's a lot of actual work that needs to go in to take us on that next leg higher. Yeah, I, I, think, I think the key here is that the market is comprised of a very different type of individual than it was in 2020. So in 2020, it was a lot of retail. It was a lot of fast money types. And when you break an all-time high, in that particular scenario, you just generate FOMO, right? People are kind of, okay, I need to get in this thing. It's gonna run away from me. It's gonna do this, it's gonna do that. And ever since Bitcoin you know, became more institutional, which I'd say actually happened in mid 2021, you saw a lot of these larger buyers come in, a lot of these more high net worth family office type people come in. These are guys that are gonna sell at plus 100%, you know, and they're gonna buy at minus 25 and they're gonna sort of dampen the volatility of this asset class. So you're probably not going to see an all-time high break and then a boom, crazy parabola, because the type of person that is in the market is exponentially more willing to sell an all-time high break than they ever, ever have been in the past. So it kind of just makes sense to me that it wouldn't go crazy parabolic right after. See, this is something that I'm struggling with. What you can't see behind the ETF flows is who's buying. You don't know whether it's hedge funds, massive retirement systems reallocating a piece of their portfolio. 
you don't know whether it's commodity you know, issuers or producers, sovereign governments. It's confusing, right? With crypto, you can kind of track, oh, you know, this is a whale wallet that has been in for a long time. It's been here since the beginning. Everything on chain is a bit more, well, at least you can, you can follow the breadcrumb trail to some sort of truth about who's buying and who's selling. And, you know, you could see right now, it's, it, whether it's the Grayscale Trust or just long-term holders selling Bitcoin to effectively BlackRock, I bet that's what's going on right now. What I can't figure out is who's behind all this ETF buying. Is it little retail people buying $10 worth of crypto and then, you know, they're going to sell it out 3% higher and chop around? Or are these new whales, new family offices, new major institutions and, you know, corporations? I'm struggling with that, and so I'm watching price action very closely right now. Um, my hypothesis is that it's a new long-term holder base. It's either long-term holders who are in GBTC because it was effectively discounted Bitcoin, rotating into something with lower fees to hold on for the next $100,000 of price action. Uh, your mom, your dentist, people just stowing it away in an IRA or a 401k or some, some retirement account. Uh, that's my thesis. I think these are long-term holders. What's scary to me is the idea, as, as a long-term holder myself, what's scary is the idea that this is, these are weak hands, that this is fast money, right? If we see three, five, 10, 20 days of consecutive outflows at 10%, you know, below the, the new all-time highs that, that we hit recently, I think we're going to be in for some of that insane bull market volatility that's going to shake a lot of, uh, shake a lot of people out of this uh, in kind of an unfortunate, uh, worst possible time kind of way. So I'm doing my best to hang on. I think that as we analyze the nature of these ETF inflows, which ultimately, not only are they, a, you know, flows, flows aren't a use case, but they are effectively the validation of Bitcoin as a store of value, which is the ultimate use case for crypto right now. You know, as we analyze how these new participants come in and treat this market, I think it'll, it'll determine a lot about how much volatility we're going to see over the course of the next 12 months. Actually, I'm curious of this audience. How many people here, raise your hand, actually own the Bitcoin ETF? Is anybody? I own Grayscale. Does that count? Yeah, Grays Grays Gray Grayscale, Grayscale counts. Uh, how many people here own any crypto at all? Wow. So proud of this audience. This is a beautiful representation of who the ETF buyers are. It's new money. Okay. Right? Because <laughs> look at all the people that own crypto yeah. and none of them, <laughs> except for a few, you know, we've got some champions out there that bought the Bitcoin ETF. But I think, I think that actually perfectly encapsulates who's buying the Bitcoin ETF. It's, it's first time buyers of crypto. It's new, it's new capital that's coming in. And Look, they're here, for, they're here for the roller coaster. I think my general take on this is that if you're buying the Bitcoin ETF, it's not necessarily because you want to buy Bitcoin now for the quick pump, for the quick win, because if that was your incentive, you probably would have figured out how to buy Bitcoin on Coinbase. It's really not that hard. So I think a lot of these people are just, you know, your, your dentists, your RAs, your slow money, your people that aren't going to sell minus 15% aren't going to sell minus 20% because they're buying Bitcoin the same way they buy the S&P. It's drilled into people that buy the S&P. Don't sell when it's down, just hold for 30 years. Well, if that's this the case, portfolio. that's insanely bullish. Yeah. And you know, your, <laughs> your structural seller, the miners, they're going to have, you know, 50% less selling to do in, in a month. Um, yeah. Stock and flow, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about Bitcoin or Bananas, you know, more buying, less selling of bananas, higher price. Does the halving still matter? Is this still relevant? I think so. I, again, I'm a commodities trader uh, in, in the way that I think. It, you deal with producer flow every day as a commodities trader. These, these people, they extract oil from the ground. They sell oil derivatives, pushes the price of oil lower. Uh, they're locking in their cash flows. Miners do exactly the same thing. I, I'm struggling to understand how it is that if you were to go and literally tell every single producer of crude oil in the world, you, your well's just depleted by 50%. You've got 50% less crude oil. 
and they do less selling, how that wouldn't lead to some sort of crazy rally. Uh, that's how I'm thinking about it. Maybe it's the wrong mental model. I, th I think you're right. This episode is brought to you by Perennial Finance. Perennial is quickly becoming one of the go-to derivatives platforms and liquidity layers for all of DeFi. So let me tell you a little bit about them. There are kind of three things you need, right? When you're thinking about a place and a platform to trade on. First one, great trade execution. Second one, low fees. And third, of course, an on-chain permissionless platform. And Perennial nails all three of those buckets. With the launch of Perennial V2, they've made all of that possible by introducing a ton of new features, such as faster oracles, which reduce trade execution to seconds, lower fees, competing with major centralized exchanges and minimizing fees for both takers and makers. Fully modular markets, which allow the protocol to support any price feed out there. And fourth, cash settled, right? The trades are cash settled in USD, not in crypto. Perennial allows you, the trader, to gain access to deeper liquidity with only a fraction of the TVL. How it works is that Perennial enables a two-sided market made up of both traders and liquidity providers, right? Traders deposit the assets to get levered exposure, while liquidity providers providers provide these pools of capital to earn fees for taking the other side of the trader position. Perennial allows you to trade crypto, perps, FX, and coming soon, NFTs and more. Backed by some of the best investors in the industry, Perennial is a must check out platform if you're a crypto trader. Go check them out by clicking the link in the description. Give 1000X some credit. Go check out Perennial. You're going to love them. All right. Let's get back to the show. Hey everyone, wanted to give a quick shout out to this episode's sponsor, Copper. Copper is an institutional custodian and provider of prime services within digital assets. Today, what I want to talk to you specifically about is Clearloop. Clearloop is a solution from Copper, which to me solves one of the biggest problems for market makers, high frequency traders, hedge funds within digital assets. You know the exquisite pain of what I call the pre-funding problem. So if you want to take advantage of arbitrages that pop up across different exchanges, or you just have a tra trading strategy which requires you to be active on multiple different centralized exchanges, you have to pre-fund your account at each one of those exchanges. Now, this is not ideal for a whole bunch of reasons. One, you have to take counterparty risk from those exchanges, which as we saw this last year can have major consequences. Two, it's capital inefficient. You have a whole bunch of assets spread out that are most of them are not doing anything most of the time. And three, it's just not great from a workflow standpoint and it creates administrative overhead. So enter Clearloop. Clearloop is the secure MPC custody solution provided by Copper. The way that it works is you deposit your assets into this MPC solution, which is owned and, owned and operated by you. Clearloop syncs up with a whole bunch of your favorite exchanges and then you can trade securely from Clearloop itself while not taking any counterparty exchange risk with any of these exchanges. And it's a super easy and nice UX. Now, Clearloop is trusted by the likes of Flow Traders, Brevin Howard, Nickel, some of the best in the business. But the coup de grace is in the extreme edge case that one of these exchanges were to go bankrupt, they have a very clever trust structure which segregates your assets and keeps you completely protected. So. Click the link at the bottom of this episode, especially if you're a hedge fund and market maker and you want to learn more or better yet, Dimitri, the CEO, is actually going to be in person on a panel hosted by yours truly at Digital Asset Summit. So DAS London, that's March 18th to the 20th in London. So you should definitely click the link at the bottom of this episode, give your boy some credit, but also even better, come to DAS London and hear from Dimitri himself. All right. Cheers, everyone. Hey, everyone. This episode is brought to you by Kinto, the safety first layer two that is accelerating the transition to the on-chain financial system. Now, I know we're all very excited about tokenization. Larry Fink certainly is. He's on CNBC talking about it all the time. And I know we're all very excited about L2s. Here's the problem, though. If we want L2s to onboard the financial system, there's a lot of stuff that we still need. And Kinto is basically rolling out solutions for that. So one, it features user-owned KYC which is just table stakes for our regulated friends. And if we want the institutional capital to come in, Kinto offers a really good solution for that. They also have native account abstraction that solves some of the largest problems with onboarding in terms of security and user experience today, which is still very confusing. So if we want to bring more folks onto Ethereum, Kinto is the way to do that. And if you believe in this on-chain financial system and you actually want to get more active in Kinto and become a founding member, you should join their launch program, which is Engine. That's E-N-G-N. -N. You can see a link in the show notes. So if you're a part of that, you can do things like participate in Kinto governance, the launch ceremony, you can priority access to product launches on Kinto. You get reduced fees and unique discounts on products launch on Kinto. So overall, if you want to be a part of Kinto and the mission that they have, I would go click the link, 
join the engine program and uh, thank me later. And also to preempt a question that a lot of people ask, which is, well, the minor flows, how would the minor flows matter because they're not that large of an aggregate percentage of the volume of Bitcoin? Their Bitcoin exists, the price of Bitcoin is based on their marginal buyer and marginal seller, and miners basically have to sell to fund their operations. So you know this flow is coming in, and when people know that flows are coming in, you know, that impacts the way that the market, the market trades. And so I think even a marginal amount of reduction in known choreographed flow into the market will change the way the market reacts and will be bullish for the market. So even if it's not you know, a large percentage, it, it is meaningful. And the second thing is that the having always brings attention. And crypto, for better or for worse, thrives on attention. That is the key driver of crypto across every asset that you've ever looked at is just how many people are looking at it at any given time. I mean, Bitcoin is one of those funny assets where it just gets more value as it goes up because the more people accept it, the more other people are convinced to accept it. That's just the nature of the asset. Uh, so as attention is paid to Bitcoin, the fundamentals go up. You, you made a good point about the marginal buyer and wh where does the marginal token exchange hands, right? As these ETFs drink up more and more of the available supply of coin, uh, there's a smaller and smaller subset of tokens available for transfer. So it's possible that the first you know, 10 billion of ETF inflows drove the price up by roughly 30K. The next 10 billion could drive the price up by 60K. There are fewer tokens available for sale. It's just, you know, they're sitting in an ETF instead of in somebody's uh, laptop at the bottom of a landfill this time. Slightly different you know, dynamics. <laughs> So what do you guys think about this idea? I've heard this a couple of times now. It actually came up on a, the Bitcoin ETF panel this morning. Uh, so you guys, like the traditional way that these cycles tend to play out, Bitcoin tends to move first, strong spotlight rally, rotation to ETH, rotation to alts, and whatever JPEG, meme coin du jour, end of cycle. This usually takes about a year and a half. And one theory that's being talked about quite a bit right now is that maybe this cycle is a little bit different because, hey, before you put your Bitcoin on a crypto exchange, then you could like very easily transition into ETH, altcoins, whatever. Now this is different because these things are locked up in an ETF. These are being held, held, held in Charles Schwab or Fidelity or whatever. Um, and maybe some of that capital is just going to be stickier there. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, I, I've, I've always wondered about this just because it, it is a new dynamic. And I think the reality is that even though the new money coming in is unlikely to rotate out, of Bitcoin because it's held on the exchange, it's, it's held in the ETF itself and not on the exchanges, you still get a rotation from the crypto native individuals that have already owned Bitcoin, that have already owned these assets, and they're gonna rotate. But that's actually what's creating the dynamic right now, yeah. which is that you're not seeing movement from things that are fundamental, right? You're not seeing a, lo a, lot, of, a lot of the older, older L1s, a lot of the DeFi applications, a lot of the things that people last cycle would have looked at and said, hey, this is a good project that produces cash flows. It's kind of interesting. Maybe I should buy it. Maybe it'll go up. Uh, the reason that that happened last cycle is because no had, nobody had any idea what they were doing, right? These are all like new people in the, in, 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 the, in the crypto world. Now what you have is you actually don't have a tremendous amount of retail. You just have a, a lot of crypto natives. And so what crypto natives know is that the things that go up the most, and everybody's just trying to maximize their PL, the things that go up the most in bull markets are meme coins. And so basically free revenue, pure plays. Yeah. <laughs> you, you you don't have the flows into the fundamental projects from the more conservative buyers, because the conservative buyers are now in the ETF. And then the people that are really willing to go down the risk curve are the people that already owned crypto. And so they're just rotating into these meme coins that are going to a billion dollars in two days, which obviously will end in tears. But, you know, it's fun for the time being. And so then the middle section is kind of left out to dry until you either get more retail coming back in or enough people get burned on meme coins and then decide that they want to be allocated to this industry. But, you know, maybe I should actually buy something that works. Um, I, I was so one of those take. people who got kind of toasted on the la in the last bull market trying to play the altcoin space on the basis of what I perceive to be fundamental value. Like, oh, wow, look at this blockchain. It's, it's got sharding, and that's so much better than where ETH is right now. It's like two years ahead of ETH, and so let me buy that. And 
you know, I, I underperformed ETH by 99% doing, you know, with that, with that mentality <laughs> and, you know, just immolated p &L until finally I decided I'm going to collapse everything, collapse the whole book into GBTC. Because if there's one thing that I deeply believe in, it's Bitcoin. And this is just deeply discounted Bitcoin. And I can do legal analysis and talk to lawyers and conclude that, you know, in the foreseeable future, this will convert to an ETF and I'll get the discount back and just hold on to this in a way that I don't get stopped out. So that worked. And so on the way back up, uh, I then became one of those people who just dismissed altcoins altogether. And Avi, thankfully, one of the benefits of podcasting with this guy is that you learn stuff, right? And he's been through a few of these cycles. He's a veteran and he, he absolutely nailed this. There was one of our podcasts where I tried to say this is, this is just a, a pure play, hold on for dear life type asset class, you know, Bitcoin's going to a million dollars a token. Why should we worry about anything else? And Avi just started shouting at me. <laughs> and Literally shouting. <laughs> he, was, he was absolutely right. Like there are, ultimately this asset class, if I had to you know, consolidate the view into a, a nutshell here, would be that the, the asset class will be taken to higher heights by proper use cases, by people adopting the, the technology, which is ultimately far better than TradFi Rails for moving money. And I can attest to this from, from my career. Um, however, in the meantime, uh, you know, it's less important to try and come up with TradFi uh, compartmentalizations of value or earnings per token or any tokenomics or any of that and try to basically try to follow the flows. And right now you have ETF flows driving Bitcoin. You have, uh, you know, cultural excitement and zeitgeist driving other elements of the space, meme coins. And you, you have an AI theme that's driving the tech sector and dr elements of the tech sector do drive elements of the crypto sector because ultimately, much like oil was in its early days, crypto is tradable technology. So, uh, you, you know, you follow those narratives and there, there are short-term profits to extract for sure. So I, I put, put on my meme coin hat and just, just went over the rails recently and... It's a little tough to focus, but yeah, um, I, I, I tend to agree with you, Avi. I think, I think while ultimately we will be validated by a use case, um, perhaps that use case will come about as a result of higher prices and we should stop tearing our hair out in the meantime. There's something funny about meme coins. I, I'm also on the rope about this, where they're, they're fun. Are they positive? I don't know. It's TBD, but they, I think they have like at least 25 or 30% of something, which is pretty true. Um, which it feels a little bit like kind of a middle finger to the people that are the fundamentalists and doing this type of analysis. Doesn't it feel like that a little bit? It's kind of like NVIDIA. NVIDIA is a great company, right? It's trading at like 50 times revenue. <laughs> you know, I mean, is it a great business? Is NVIDIA's business real? But are we all kind of sitting around wondering like, is this really trading on fundamentals or not? I feel like that's what meme coins are kind of putting their finger on. Just well, quick, honestly, oh, I'll sorry, say go that, ahead. Uh, no, sorry, but I'll say that this is infinitely better than it was six, seven years ago. Because seven years ago, what would happen is there'd be some guy sitting in his basement and he'd launch an ICO and he'd say, this ICO is going to revolutionize everything from your fridge to airplanes to your shoes. There's going to be IoT and everything. Your whole life is going to, it's going to be incredible. What are you talking about, Avi? <laughs> <laughs> like, you buy this and you're going to become super rich and you're going to live on Mars. And now you buy something called Slurf because it's funny. <laughs> and <laughs> they both accomplish the same thing, <laughs> which is that they go up. But at least one is telling you the truth. You're buying it because it's funny. <laughs> I mean, right, they don't so, always go up. <laughs> right, you know, so there's like, a, there's like a, little bit of a, a little bit of a difference. I actually view this as a more uh, straightforward, more honest version of crypto than it was before because the way that I view crypto are they're sort of, Right, there is genuine real tech here that is going to change the world. Now, how that's going to be implemented, right? How are stocks going to be represented as tokens? Are they going to tra trade on blockchains? And my, my bet is 100% yes. In the next 10 years, there's going to be a tremendous amount of revolution on back-end infrastructure and finance. You guys are already getting bored, right? So it's, this, is, this, this is the thing. That is going to be amazing tech. But it's going to be very hard to speculate on that because what's going to happen is it's going to be built out by these large institutions. They may or may not actually need a token. Your life will be better. Things will be more interoperable. You'll be able to send money overseas more easily. But is there a way to necessarily make money on that other than betting on the companies 
that are building that out. Maybe there's no token actually associated with that form of tech. And then you have the crypto world, right? And there are going to be some, some tokens that provide critical infrastructure to L1s, right? So for example, the liquid staking tokens might actually be very beneficial and accrue a ton of value over the next, over the next five to 10 years. And then you have Bitcoin, and then you have some L1s that will capture some value. But in my personal view, the reality is that a lot of these tokens won't necessarily generate value. And I think that's actually what the market is voicing to you. It's that, hey, there's going to be a lot of institutional interest because this technology is real. But most of these tokens are actually not going to be valuable in the future. Bitcoin is going to be super valuable. Some L1, some L2, some infrastructure layer stuff is going to be super valuable. And then what is the rest of crypto but a wonderful, massive casino? And look, don't get me wrong, the casino, casino world generates $100 billion a year in revenue. So that's obviously going to be a big sector. But I think that's what the market is sort of voicing now. That's why a lot of these things that we view as fundamentals aren't picking up. Because does a borrow, look, you know, does a borrow lend platform really need a token? No, oh, you know, maybe, maybe not, um, in my personal opinion. I mean, I think that you, you strike on a really valuable point there, which is that the casino industry has some value to it. We shouldn't dismiss it. And I think what's refreshing about this cycle, you know, is that people in the institutional space, people who wear suits and ties to work, will admit, even if they work in crypto, hey, you know, there's, it's a little bit more fun to light up a phantom wallet and gamble on some of these zeitgeisty memes than it is to go to, go to some depressing casino and, and pull the arm of a slot machine, right? So, that's okay, and we've accepted that as an industry now. I think that the future of crypto, you know, to, to your point, Mike, it might be a little distracting or upsetting to the builders in the space who are you know, in the trenches, writing code, trying to build difficult products and complex services that use this amazing technology called blockchain. It might be a little annoying to them that meme coins called Slur for thousand Xing overnight, but I think you know, one of the one of the powerful things about learning from the success of others and the success of things going on around you is that, um, you know, I would hope that builders in crypto gamify more elements of the products that they build and make them more exciting to use than our, our current infrastructure, which is, you know, slow, boring, um, and not necessarily that rewarding uh, from the perspective of the user experience. So. One of the reasons why I'm so bullish, aside from the having and the, the geopolitical tinfoil hat stuff that I could bore you with for hours, is um, just the fact that we have sort of broken through that barrier of good user experience in crypto recently. And did I expect it to be meme coins? No, we were all expecting it to be games, de decentralized physical infrastructure, RWAs. You know, we all thought, hey, this is going to be the, the cycle where Uber drivers are using Hive Mapper to build a real-time you know, visual representation of planet Earth, and this is so exciting. That will probably happen, but hey, meme coins happen first, and the user experience is amazing, so let's just celebrate that, I guess. It's the first step, and certainly bullish the price. Yeah, and, and this conversation is actually very important for investing, because you have to understand what you're investing in, right, when you, when you, put, money, when you put money in the crypto. Like, what are, you, what are you actually truly, truly betting on? So, for example, you look at all these AI, AI X crypto applications that are, that, are, that are popping off. Well, they're actually non-crypto versions of this that are doing 10x, 20x the revenue of, oh, de decentralized, oh, I'm going to rent your GPU for this, for this, for this, right? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that these things won't go up, because if you look at the broad swath of investing in AI, there's actually really no way to invest in AI except for NVIDIA unless you're investing in private companies, which is why a lot of these AI coins are popping off so heavily because people are desperately searching for a way to bet on what they perceive is going to be the future, which is AI, and I agree with that. But are these projects really going to be it? I mean, maybe some of them, maybe not, but you, you, know, you have to understand a lot of these things 5, 10x because there was no other place to go put that capital. And sometimes that happens in crypto a lot, is crypto, it's so easy to attach a token, it's so easy to attach crypto to whatever hot industry exists at the time. And then if you know what game you're playing, fine, you can play that game, you can invest in it, but don't get suckered by it, right? Understand that, you know, it might not be real or not, but then there are real things out there, right? Because I think that a lot of the infrastructure that's going to be built, that we're going to use, is going to be built on platforms like Ethereum, like Solana, like Avalanche. There are going to be real real applications deployed on these on these layers 
and that means that they are going to generate value, right? So there are real things in crypto, but sometimes it's very easy to get you know, confused as to what is real, what is not, because some things might sound real, and then it turns out they're not, and then some things, you know, are real. Yeah, that's real, a great but point. Why, takes, you know? where, where else other than a high-quality L1 like Ethereum or Solana would, a, you know, would you try to launch a global decentralized GPU rental project? Um, I know Stanford did it in the 90s with the protein folding mm -hmm. thing, but they didn't, you know. These days, how, how would you do it? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of real stuff that go, that's going on. It just takes so much time. And one thing to bring it back to, you know, your question that you asked, Joan, about weak hands versus strong hands. One, like, unlock for me was looking at a lot of these tokens, Some many of which will not be around in, many, in a couple of years, some of which will, is the underlying driver what's making Bitcoin go up versus your favorite meme coin is the same thing, right? This is currency debasement in my perspective. There's too much money chasing too few things. People want to speculate. Um, and actually, Aviota, to shill an episode of 1000X, you had this great example of, okay, once you identify what the driver of a trade is, you, you have to figure out what structure, right? So you had this example of a guy who goes to Japan and he figures out how to structure this very clever trade. And at least for me, I think you could look at these things and very uh, logically and pragmatically say, if I think what's driving everything right now is this overwhelming currency debasement, then maybe Bitcoin is the safer thing, but I could take a little bit of risk and punt on some of this other stuff as well. I think, I think the, the, the guy that structured the Bitcoin trade the best in the entire world is Michael Saylor. I mean, what he's done is just this beautiful feat of financial engineering. The fact that now he has this perpetual debt printing machine that he can buy more Bitcoin with is just, it really is. It's a testament to his financial engineering, honestly, more than anything else. And there's still a huge premium on the stock yeah. as well, relative to the Bitcoin they hold, which is, I thought that would go away after the uh, ETFs launch, but it's hung on, which but, is pretty crazy. But, but it's 100% true, the first thing that you said, which is that this is a response to currency debasement. And we saw this in Nigeria. Um, a few weeks ago where they actually are now trying to completely ban crypto because the first the first three months of the year has been very bad for the naira which is a nigerian currency it's basically you know inflated a ton i think it it basically went from 900 to 1500 per per dollar and they're they're in trouble and they realized that crypto was actually exacerbating the problem so that says two things one like people genuinely do flee to crypto during times of stress in some places. And when you see it in some places, I think it's actually pretty easy to say, well, if so many people are doing this in Nigeria, then the next country that this happens to, people tend to look for examples of what should I do? And then it becomes mimetic and it actually might reinforce itself. And then the second thing is that governments actually recognize this and they know that it's going to be a problem and they're worried about it. And so when I see Bitcoin and crypto and meme coins and all this, all this stuff going up, I mean, I, I do think it's in no small part because of those fears. I think, you know, not to get too grandiose about where we are in the world, but it's, it's a weird, we're in a weird spot. It's there, a, there are a lot of weird things going on, a lot of, you know, a lot of dangerous flashpoints right now. And I think that's, a, that's one reason why Bitcoin and cryptocurrency has been doing so well. And I think that's one reason why there was an urgency to get a Bitcoin ETF approved is because the people that were pushing it understand this, that this is a, this is a time in the world that is, we're going into unprecedented times. It, it belongs in an institutional, Bitcoin belongs in an institutional portfolio, because while it may not be a good inflation hedge or even a good levered NASDAQ proxy, it is certainly a debasement hedge. And in countries like Nigeria, where I used to deal with physical crude oil or, you know, Istanbul, uh, when the, actually not, this would have been Ankara, wherever their central bank is in Turkey, when they started uh, cutting interest rates to combat inflation, insane policy like that, or, or in Argentina, where, you know, you have hyperinflation. If you're just a, an ordinary person trying to store value, um, you know, there's not even a debate that Bitcoin's a better place or Ethereum is a better place to, to hold value than uh, the local currency. And so my thesis is that crypto, Bitcoin specifically, is a monetary economic system in a box that ultimately is better than at least 50% of the world's fiat currencies insofar as a store of value and probably a means of exchange too. Um, you know, if, if you're a Turkish person living in Turkey, when... Uh, Erdogan is instructing the central bank to cut rates to combat inflation, and there's hyperinflation in a black market for exchange rates and a, a you know, an 
artificial government approved market, um, you know, you can't just put your money in dollars in a JP Morgan Chase checking account or HSBC. Tether, it's a great place, right? Or, uh, you know, Bitcoin. So ultimately, I do think that this is a threat to governments uh, because it, it basically runs in the face of uh, fiat money as an experiment, which ultimately started in, what, 1971, when Nixon took the world off the gold standard, effectively. And it went well for starters, but then during COVID, uh, it kind of started to abuse it. I don't know, pull up M1 money supply. The Fed has a great chart. Thing, thing went kind of parabolic. And uh, I think Bitcoin should, too, as a result. We've got only a couple of minutes left here. I want to do a quick lightning round with you guys, ask you some questions. All right, three years from now, what is your price predict? Where is Bitcoin at? Exactly three years from now? Sure. Mm, 59,842. Wow. <laughs> Lower. That's bearish. Uh, yeah, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to hit 150. Don't worry. All right. All right. Fair enough. I think we're at 250. <laughs> 250. <laughs> yeah. All right. Big discrepancy there. Alter Bitcoin, which does better this cycle? Risk adjusted, sharp, no. Sortino. No, just give me straight. Which, which oh. one? A basket. Bitcoin. <laughs> Bitcoin. Don't talk any of that stuff. I don't understand what you just said. <laughs> okay, well, you know, alts. You know, they're high, they're high beta, and I think uh, I, I think that's that's going to do well. But I think the the optimal portfolio is a is a barbell Bitcoin meme coin portfolio. You know, you know like 85 percent Bitcoin, five percent slurf, five percent zin. You know. <laughs> 5% dog with hat or, you know, whatever. How do you pronounce that? Whiff? Whiff. Whiff, whiff not with. Yeah. Whiff. I like Joe Bowden. <laughs> That's mine. Right. No need to get political. <laughs> no, no, no. This is not a political statement. You know, Joe Bowden is very different from Joe Biden. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Jenna, what do you think? Alter Bitcoin this cycle. I'm with Avi. I think, uh, I think you hold Bitcoin. That's where you get steady gains. And I think... One thing I've learned from 18 years of professional trading is uh, it's really hard to learn without skin in the game. So I would say smart people want to take some of their gains from Bitcoin and diversify and try to learn and keep their fingers on the pulse of a few different alt markets. Alt a one trade. Is it dead or still alive? No, it's, it's alive and kicking and well, ex except that it's just all new L1s now. Indeed. Because new, the, the thesis is new coin good. If new... It's good. If old, it's bad. All right, so we like new alt, new alt L1s. Jen, what do you think? I, I wrote the alt L1 thesis off for dead, and I just couldn't have been more wrong. Solana uh, has done really well, despite my best predictions. Um, yeah, I think uh, some alt L1s will eclipse maybe even Ethereum. Just five seconds on this. The user experience of all L1s has gone through the roof everywhere except for Ethereum. And so I think that is what's actually going to drive it, is that it's just genuinely fun to use Solana. It's a genuinely good experience now. Uh, in the long run, Solana or Ethereum? Both of them? Can, can we say that? Both is, yes, but I'm going to make you pick. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty bearish on Ethereum, to be completely honest, and this is coming from somebody that doesn't even particularly like Solana. I'm just more bearish on Ethereum than I am bullish on Solana, so I guess Solana. I, I, wish, I wish I could call a friend here, poll the audience. Uh, I would say I'm bearish on Ethereum too, only because I'm scared. But uh, I would think you know, institutions, if they're going to settle assets somewhere, they're probably going to start on Ethereum rather than Solana if you're you know, BlackRock trying to put something on chain. So I, I think there's life in that one, and it'll come through and become visible later in this cycle. All right, in 15 seconds each, you have advice to give to people who are investing in crypto for the first time. What do you think? Keep it simple. Don't get freaked out. Don't invest in anything that you don't know and don't over leverage yourself. Uh, my advice, having gone through the institutional crypto trading uh, apparatus, I would say that no asset class in history has been better optimized for your personal account. Um, you don't need to work in an institution to generate asymmetric, incredible returns in crypto. The data is practically free. A lot of the providers sponsor this conference. Um, spin up a few podcasts and you know, spend 100 or $200 a, a year on data and trading view, and you're good to go. You don't, need to, you don't necessarily need to rely on this bucking bronco of a, of a space for cash flow. You can play with it personally and extract value elsewhere. I will second that just for a second. Some of the smartest 
most well-rounded and wealthiest people that I know in crypto never worked for an institution, never traded for anyone else. They just figured this out themselves because everything is available for you to learn out there online. And if you're intelligent enough and hardworking enough to go figure it out, you can go figure it out. That's the beauty. There's very, very little barriers to entry for your average individual to come into this if they're you know, dedicated enough. Yeah, if you're, if you're a commodities trader and you want to trade um, you know, Asian propane versus U.S. Gulf Coast propane, you can't even get started without you know, a million dollar a year sunk cost for data and exchange access and lines and everything. Uh, meanwhile, crypto, you could start with a very small amount. That and you can't put a Bitcoin and meme coin barbell on at an institution. That's the real alpha. All right, guys, this is all the time we have. Give them a round of applause.